Uh, perhaps let's start. So it's a, a, it's a pleasure to have Cosme who's going to talk about rainbow matching and hypergraphs. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to speak in the seminar. <clears throat> so uh, my plan today would be to tell you about some recent joint work with uh, Lisa Sauerman and Dimitri Zakara from MIT. And as the title said, um, it would be about a story involving rainbow matrix and hypergraphs, which I should say maybe it's, it's, it's an old, uh, rather old topic in combinatorics, directly connected with questions that have to do with finding transversals with certain properties in Latin squares, objects that were introduced by Euler many, many years ago. Uh, I won't really take this path at all today, unless you're interested maybe and can hear more about that. Instead, I decided to maybe uh, show you more personal path to these kind of problems that goes through several questions in additive combinatorics. So uh, let me start, I guess, with the with the, with the teaser, which uh, perhaps uh, a lot of you are already familiar with. So given a positive integer and at least three, you can ask, what is the smallest n? Say that. In every sequence of big N integers, there exists a subsequence of length little n that has a zero sum. There exist some indices I want to apply n uh, such that if you take the corresponding sum of the elements in that sequence, that sum is zero modulo n. <clears throat> so uh, here it's perhaps important to emphasize talking about sequences so the numbers can appear with repetitions. Uh, so for example, a quick observation is that well, two n minus two numbers in such a sequence are not enough. We can take, for example, the first n minus two, one terms to be zero, the next n minus one terms to be uh, equal to one. So if you denote this quantity, well, let's, say, let's say f of n for now, this example immediately uh, shows that uh, this function is at least two n minus one. You definitely need at least two n minus one to or to hope for something like this to be true. <laughs> but turns out that minus one integers are enough. This is a classical theorem, the Erdos, Ginsburg and Z from the 60s. In 61. I, I don't really write the uh, notes, so I apologize in advance if I'm gonna mess up the years. Please take them with plus minus three <laughs> every time I write some here. Uh, so Erdos, Ginsburg, you famously showed that, well, uh, this function fn is actually equal with n minus one. Any, any sequence of that length you give me, you always have n, n terms that uh, have some that zero modulo n. And uh, this is the start of many, many nice, nice, nice stories. Uh, it's really the beginning of an area of combinatorics called zero sum Ramsey theory. Uh, many, many questions of this flavor follow through. The usual arguments uh, uh, for this uh, follow the follow, I mean, follow a certain recipe. So there are usually two steps. There is a, a multiplicative property that the statement satisfies. If, if I can show that uh, I can can always extract a zero sum of length a among two minus one numbers. So if I have an upper bound like this, and I have uh, an upper bound like this for b, I know how to extract a zero sum of length b mo modulo b among two b minus one numbers, and uh, I know how to extract zero sum of length a b from two times a, b minus one numbers. That's a nice elementary argument. So this, this is true for every choice of a and b. That makes sense. And then, well, proving that this, this, uh, this upper bound, 10 minus one 
the minus one upper bar is multiplicative reduces the problem to showing it for primes. So uh, the second step is uh, settle the case n equals prime. Typically, all the ideas involved just to involve some kind of early day application of the polynomial method. Early day application of the polynomial method. So things like uh, Chevrolet warning, combinatorial Neustadt-Einsatz, Cauchy Davenport, uh, group ring approach that tends to be morally equivalent. Uh, all of those can be used in some sense in morally equivalent ways to, uh, to handle the case when n equals p. So uh, to kick this off, I thought I would uh, tell you about somewhat more entertaining proof. Little alone, that doesn't really go through uh, this reduction to the case when n equals the prime number. So. Uh, now, this result also follows uh, from a result about rainbow magic. I'll define them all what these things are. Um, but perhaps it's easiest also to. Uh, Explain by putting a picture. So let me give you four different matchings of size four. <clears throat> and think of them that you have on the same set of vertices and think of them as uh, being of different colors. Well, no, let's say this is the second one. Uh, yeah. So green, um, like this. I don't know, let's see with yellow, uh, something like this. Yeah, four, four different matchings that you can think of having different colors on the same set of eight vertices. And then a rainbow matching is a, is a matching that has uh, on the same, the, it's a matching on the same set of vertices, but has uh, an edge of a different color. So for instance, in this picture, you can choose, of course, something like this. <clears throat> The rainbow matching for this set of four matches. So what is uh, what is uh, the theorem one can use to prove the Erdős against Borzi result? Uh, it's a nice theorem of Drisco from the nineties. Let's say ninety eight. Also uh, refined a bit later by Aharoni and Berger. Late two thousands, maybe early two thousands. Let's say oh wait. Um, so it's the following: I give you any family of two n minus one matchings in a bipartite graph. So uh, let's say e family m one two n minus one. I say of matching of size n in a bipartite graph. Any such family determines a rainbow perfect match. I shouldn't say perfect match. Rainbow match of size n. So to explain a little bit my uh, uh, my slip, the, the reason I, 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 I keep saying perfect matching is because, well, uh, initially, Drisco proved this result in uh, bipartite graphs that have n plus n vertices. 
in which case matching of size n are perfect matchings. Uh, and then Aharoni and Berger uh, realized that you don't need the bipartite graph to have uh, n vertices and n vertices. It holds. It's a statement about uh, matchings of a fixed size in, in an arbitrary bipartite graph. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to explain again more formally what this means. So there are some indices I want to I n and edges e1 and the matching corresponding to the first index, e2 matching corresponding to the second index, en corresponding to matching the last index such that this set of edges is a matching of size n. So something like this, and uh, the deduction is very fast. So uh, you actually apply this statement in the case when the bipartite graph has n vertices and vertices. In fact, even uh, uh, even more structured bipartite graph, the complete bipartite graph. <laughs> um, on two copies of Z mod n. And you, uh, if your sequence of numbers uh, is A1 up to A2n minus one, you associate a matching for each number. So you associate the matching uh, x comma x plus ai as you vary x Z mod n for each each element in here is sent to uh, x plus a i, and I vary, I, I, I vary x. And of course, this is a perfect matching. <clears throat> uh, if you have 20 minus 1 uh, um, integers in your initial list, you have 20 minus 1. Uh, Perfect matchings by Driscoll as a set of indices. Uh, and edges. Uh, I'll write it again. So edges so that you have a rainbow, and this corresponds to um, some elements. Uh, Some edges that form a perfect matching in this graph. <clears throat> in other words, if you look at the x coordinates, that's just the permutation of z mod n. The y coordinates also permutation of z mod n. Sum those up. That means zero sum subsequence mod n. <clears throat> So um, I should say now that the risk theorem is sharp. So uh, yeah. So is Aharoni Berger is this? It's a matrix result, right? It's the intersection of matrix and simplicial complex. Yeah, I'll say a bit more. Uh, some things about the more general. And is the Drisco as well, or is it actually the graph? Yeah, graph uh, Drisco, in fact, initially formulated this result as a statement about transverses and uh, Latin squares. So, via this kind of translation between them, it's, it's, a, it's a graph theoretic result. He didn't go on this full generality. Aharoni and Berger study a bit more general, and there are some later results that I'll mention in a moment that uh, capture the hypergraph kind of story. But uh, first, I want to say a few things about this because it's, uh, even the graph case is surrounded by some nice problems, and it's a two hour talk. so. Uh, I'll, I'll try to maximize entertainment uh, as well. <clears throat> so this first theorem is sharp. In the sense that uh, uh, 
result is not true if you replace 2n minus 1 with 2n minus 2. So if you take, for instance, an even cycle, uh, you can take n minus 1 uh, copies of this perfect matching in blue and n minus 1 copies of the perfect matching in red. To see that uh, in this in this uh, this collection, there's no rainbow matching because well, um, you would need uh, need n edges, <clears throat> and uh, you have to use two color. Oh, well, you don't have enough. Um, so this this is of course via yeah, this translation, not too difficult to see that it's really the same as this example. <clears throat> uh, uh, so kind of fascinating problem, actually. Uh, wanted to mention is that this is not true. Uh, so this, this thing is no longer true in non bipartite graphs. So it's not necessarily true that if you have two n minus one matchings, you get the rainbow. Uh, what can you do? Uh, well, you can add one, one extra matching to this picture, provided that n is even. So for example, you can put these diagonals. <clears throat> um, so of course, if, if uh, n minus one matchings were in a, a rainbow matching. If it were to exist, it would have to use some of the yellow edges because otherwise it would exist in the previous picture. But once you use an yellow edge, let's say, I don't know, this one, then uh, the fate of this vertex uh, is uh, it's not looking so good because then you cannot match it with anything else. The only edges that involve it are these, and I cannot use either of them because it will involve the endpoint of this edge. So uh, the matching, the minus one matchings are not enough. Um, and it's um, a really nice conjecture um, by Barat, Garfash, Sarkozy. Uh, from the 90s. That uh, maybe two N matchings are enough in any bipartite graph. Uh, this is still open. I think it's a really beautiful problem. <clears throat> uh, and some nice results uh, for it. So, uh, a paper, Tony, I think from early, maybe late 2000s, Mahaloni, Berger, Chudnowski, Howard, and Seymour. Uh, the whole space showed that uh, n minus two matchings are enough. <clears throat> okay. So that's kind of the story for graphs. I would like to pause for a moment, uh, <laughs> give you a second to think about this. I think it's really cute. Uh, I thought for quite a bit, if there is some way to maybe uh, reduce this question to this one, I think it's uh, out of the question, but uh, 
It's of course a difficult, difficult thing uh, that people probably tried. <clears throat> um, I want to take a moment to also draw an analogy between this deduction here and uh, Rod's theorem, additive combinatorics, and a different side of additive combinatorics, which, as you know, is this question about subsets of one up to n uh, that do not contain non trivial three Ps. Was this planned before the result last night, or are you just including it because of the result last night? No connection, but it's, it's, it's uh, of course, I think I'm mentioning this because of. Uh, this Blueprint last night. I'll mention, by the way, for context, what is this blueprint that uh, Ryan has been alluding to. Um, so uh, I give you a set that doesn't contain three pieces, so non trivial. Uh, then uh, A has size middle of N. As you know, this, this has also several proofs, uh, each with different merits, different directions, general lines. But uh, the one that uh, kind of sticks out here. Uh, is a combinatorial proof is in the so called induced matching lemma. What is this induced matching lemma? I give you a graph G. Um, and then the vertices, let's say. So that G is. Uh, a union of n or at most n induced matching. <laughs> These are matchings such that there's no picture like this. There are no two edges in one of the matching that also capture an edge from a different matching between two of the endpoints like this. So no, no picture like this. <clears throat> Then, um, the fault that the number of edges of this graph is little over n squared. The graph must be sparse. So this is a statement that usually goes hand in hand with the triangle removal lemma. In some ways, it's equivalent, maybe not formally equivalent, but uh, the upper bounds in this quantitative results are really uh, the same as the upper bounds. The quantitative dependency between the epsilon and delta and the triangle removal lemma. And uh, this, this theorem here implies, implies uh, Rod's theorem by considering, in some sense, dual matchings to the ones that uh, I wrote down here. So, kind of the proof. Uh, you take uh, bipartite graph, let's say, on two copies of the slightly larger interval from 3n to 3n. And then uh, for every uh, x and one up to n, rather than for every element of a, you associate matching m of x, which is really the set of edges of this form as you vary a in your 3p free set. So if I start with the 3p free set, I define this, this, uh, this graph here in this bipartite graph <clears throat> um, it's easy to check that if it has no 3p there's no picture like this these matchings are actually induced there are n of them you have one for each element and if this is sparse well uh, The result followed by just observing that the number of edges is at least eight and that. <clears throat> so this 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 uh, this, this, tape, well, this uh, these two columns capture. I mean, there are so many open problems around it, and uh, indeed, I'll be remiss if I would mention, draw attention at least uh, on uh, some nice developments. So, just for context, the best known construction. Or, or Ross theorem is a tuberent. In the 50s, 
Uh, so there is a 3AP free set. When size um, a constant times something like this and over exponential of root log n. And uh, uh, the other a meta, I should emphasize that this is just a preprint from yesterday night. Uh, so February 13th, <clears throat> uh, from the looks of it, uh, uh, the remarkable breakthrough on this problem showing that for any 3 AP free set, <clears throat> the size of A is uh, variant type. So it's upper bounded by a constant and over some uh, term like this, an exponential of uh, power of log. The power of log is not one half, but something like 0.1 is safe, or maybe one over 11, something like this. <clears throat> so of course, this still needs to resist the, the tests coming in the next few days, but. Uh, it's looking quite good. Then uh, I think just just in the spirit of, uh, of crazy things happening in the in additive combinatorics, it, uh, I wanted to maybe mention uh, maybe also a very another very important open problem here would be to just improve quantitatively on uh, on this bound in the combinatorial setup. So here, best known bounds, as I said, go hand in hand with removal lemma. So something like this. Is possible and squared over some uh, exponential of log star. Then, but even uh, so, just refining this, probably my things for the Google lemma. So, uh, even showing some, so not, 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 nothing, it's well, big question whether. You know, Berenthai bounds would be possible for trying to remove the lemma. It's completely out of reach, probably. But uh, even something where you take an iterated number of logs, a constant number of times, would be a power. It would be a really uh, big breakthrough. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, um, I want to say a few words about this Driscoll theorem. <clears throat> How it's proved and some results uh, that also motivate the paper graph discussion. So, uh, so what is this proof of this first theorem? At least in the case when uh, the matchings are perfect matching. So uh, G is a bipartite graph. Inputs and vertices. Main idea is to use the following result from uh, convex geometry. So this is. Uh, so called colorful uh, Theodori theorem. Yeah, I'm due to Barani, uh, early 80s. And I stopped uh, eyeballing random numbers for the years. But let me continue uh, to maybe 82. Uh, I, don't, I think this one might be correct. So, uh, what is this theorem? It's, uh, it's the following statement uh, given collection of point sets. Say 2D point sets. So these are subsets of R2D. They're finite, all of them. So finite collections of points. And they're such that um, the all one vector. Okay, I don't need to. So the all one vector. So I give you a point, and it's in the uh, positive cone determined by each of these point sets. So X 
and then the positive cone of pi for all i's from one up to two b. By the way, I'm stating this in terms of positive cones rather than convex holes, equivalent, uh, more or less. So I give you a setup like this. X is really the cone of all the sets. Then this uh, color for cut or the RTM tells you that there is uh, a transversal. So there is a point P1 in the first, point, set, point P2 in the second, point in the last point set, such that X is in the cone generated by, um, by these different, different guys. <clears throat> Um, how do you use something like this <clears throat> uh, to prove this call? Um, okay, well, um, we have this by graph <clears throat> and vertices and vertices. And well, we can label the vertices <clears throat> by pointing R to the um, R to the two n. <clears throat> okay, maybe I should have. Uh, yeah, I think that's why I used here two by accident. It's the statement about we don't need even dimensions or anything, but in the application it will be even. <clears throat> Apologies. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, I give you the the graph here. And label the vertices on the left, A1, AN, ones on the right, B1, BN, such that uh, this list of vertices, into them as points in R to the twin, not any points. The sequence is just the sequence of standard basis vectors in R to the twin. Okay, so this is the first half of the standard basis. This is the second half. Okay. I have these different uh, two n minus one matchings, perfect matchings in this case of size n. For each of them, I'm going to associate the point set. This is okay. What was going to be the point set? So. Every time I have an edge in my matching, M sub K, I take the sum of the corresponding points. <clears throat> Over all the edges, A, I, B, J in the matching, um, get the point. It's a special point also. Notice that it has precisely two coordinates that are equal to one. So in particular, uh, this, well, it's, these are definitely points in R to the 2n, but notice that they secretly lie in a co dimension one plane. They lie in this, uh, this hyperplane here, <clears throat> where the sum of the entries is equal with two. Okay, so if you have a list of n minus one perfect matchings, Uh, we get a set of two n minus one point sets and secretly lie in a copy of R to the two n minus one. And notice that since these are perfect matchings, all one vector lies in the positive cone determined by each pk. Right? If I just sum up all the points in here in pk, I go, go over a single edge, every single edge in mk. I write the point, sum all the points. Perfect matching means that sum is all one, one, one. So this is perfect. This satisfies the hypothesis of this colorful karate. Theodori means that uh, there are some points P1 in the first one, P2 and minus one in the last one. So is that one on one is in this transverse cone generated by this transversal. <clears throat> um. 
The proof is almost over. This is uh, very close to desired outcome. However, uh, it doesn't yet give us a rainbow perfect matching. So these are, if you if you lift back these points, the edges that they where they come from. So we get indeed two n minus one edges of different colors. You get that one on one is in the cone, but uh, it only gives you a fractional perfect matching. So a reminder. Perhaps. Not really necessary in the Sonians, but quickly uh, uh, give on a set of edges in a graph. G, uh, fractional perfect matching or a fractional matching. Perfect matching. It's a function. On this uh, subset of edges, non negative values such that the sum of the values of this function over all the edges that are incident to a given vertex uh, is at most one. So that's the definition uh, of a fractional matching equal to one if, if you're looking for a perfect match. Uh, the size of fractional perfect matching is by definition the full sum of the values. And maybe one more piece of notation uh, the fractional transversal number this is the maximum size. The fractional perfect matching supported on a set of edges. <clears throat> oh, the statement. Sorry. Word usage. <clears throat> so, uh, what is the last part? It's a rule to not write on this, no? <clears throat> you can write. Yes, yes. It's um, Okay, so this in mind, uh, note now that this application of colorful Karateodori gives you that, well, uh, there exists a rainbow fractional matching. And it's rainbow, as I said, because it comes from the, the lifts of these points. Okay, so. Uh, This is uh, the image of the edge uh, one. Uh, image of the edge and minus one. We have these uh, different edges. Actually, matching in there. And then, the kind of the, the important punchline is that uh, it being a bipartite graph. Existence of a fractional matching on a set of edges implies the existence of, a, of an integral normal uh, normal uh, matching, <clears throat> perfect matching in this case. This is if you want an application of Koenig's theorem. Vicinity of uh, one Neumann road 
here. Uh, it's also a consequence of the fact that if you consider the fractional matching polytope in, uh, in, uh, in the Euclidean space of dimension equal to the number of edges, that's just the convex hull of the characteristic vectors of the, the integral perfect matchings. So uh, if you have some, 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 uh, some fractional perfect matches, so the point inside, it must come from some linear, some convex combination of integral perfect matching. So typically, in fact, you have multiple perfect matchings in the graph if you, if you, if you have one fractional one. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the story, uh, the, the story for graphs. <clears throat> I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it would be very, very nice if, uh, if uh, one can handle the general case for non microtech graphs. This, this implication fails, and it's uh, hard to circumvent. <clears throat> uh, let me switch to hypergraphs and mention some. So also, similarly, you can ask the same problem uh, in an R uniform hypergraph with arbitrary uniformity. So given R at least three, well, at least two, I guess, to capture the graph question. Um, and H R uniform. Um, um, what is the smallest number and such that in every list of uh, T matchings? I'll change the variable from little n to t to emphasize that this, these questions are not really about the size of the underlying host graph or hypergraph graph, but about the sizes of the matchings involved. So I, I give you two parameters, r and t. What's the smallest n such that in every family of t matching, so matchings of size t in H, uh, let's say m1 n, There exists a rainbow matching the size T. Okay, so with this, I should give it a, give some. Uh, some names, so you can ask the same question. Are partite graphs captures this, uh, this uh, bipartite graph discussion? So let me put some notation. It's called f of RT, the smallest such n in general for our arbitrary R uniform hypergraphs. No, but no R partite in this condition. Now that's uh, the bipartite version of the function here on the left. It's not my R partite version. Uh, not too difficult. You see, all well, okay, maybe after unwinding the, reminding you the notation here. So with this notation, we saw that f of two t, this is two t minus one. This is this Driscoll uh, Haroni Berger result. And uh, for big F, we don't know the precise value, but we know it's between two t. This was this example with the. This even cycle where we added the matching. So the yeah, upper bound 3t minus 2, 3t minus 2 matchings of size t are enough to give you rainbow matching of size t. This was this, uh, uh, this uh, Aharoni, Berger, Chudnowski, Howard Seymour result. <clears throat> it's not too difficult to see that uh, you can always construct linearly many matchings of size t with no rainbow. But this constant depends on the uniformity. <clears throat> okay, so let me tell you what, what is known about this. Got this. I don't know. 
So this was a question started by uh, Haroni and Berger, I should have mentioned, early 2000s. And uh, okay, maybe, maybe uh, in the interest of time, uh, uh, I won't say everything that I should say. Of course, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's an interesting question for hypergraphs, just for these connections about with problems about transversals and Latin squares, they typically tend to be reformulated in terms of uh, rainbow matches and hypergraphs rather than graphs. <clears throat> uh, but uh, also uh, this, this, uh, this kind of uh, parallel with additive combinatorics carries very well. So uh, maybe just briefly. Uh, it's going hand in hand. Uh, Erdos Ginsburg's Eve, the Erdos Ginsburg's Eve story. So, uh, if uh, more generally, you define the following function, I use this notation to uh, make my connection easier <laughs> in a moment. So, I can ask about the smallest number of vectors that you need. Then every sequence many vectors in, in, in the space. Uh, you have T of them with centroid uh, is, uh, is zero, is the origin. <clears throat> All right, there exist T indices. So this, this is uh, uh, what's known as the erdos ginzburg constant in this, this additive uh, group. Uh, the teaser problem that I started with is just this result when r equals two, this is two t minus one. Again, I remember I swapped t with n. Um, so um, there are many, uh, Things known about uh, about this function <clears throat> known when r equals three, and uh, uh, a very celebrated result of Alon and Dubiner from the late nineties. Ninety something. That uh, for every fixed r. Dimension. There is this some constant that depends on R such that this thing is uh, um, linear in T. Also, note this that essentially from the same argument. This EGZ function is dominated by uh, by the hypergraph function. Okay, maybe this is its own word. Uh, R pi type version. Okay, so uh, it's very easy to associate if I give you a sequence of vectors like this in this space, uh, and you're seeking a uh, zero sum of length t and mod t, you can associate uh, an R uniform hypergraph. And uh, in the obvious way, let's say, three uniform, you put three copies. Uh, 
if your vectors are, I don't know, let's say AI, BI, coordinates, for each vector you associate the matching of size T, you kind of go for, through every X and Z mod T, and you do, uh, you put the triangle X, X plus AI, X plus BI. <clears throat> that if you start with this, with, uh, you start with this many vectors, have a rainbow matching, rainbow perfect matching in this case, this is the complete, I guess, uh, three part type uniform hypergraph on these three vertices, and, uh, and uh, a rainbow matching corresponds to zero sum, like in the previous thing. So we have this comparison, which uh, led to a very nice conjecture. Uh, the balloon, the buzz, 10 or 11, I'll say 11. Also reiterated later by several authors, in particular, uh, Glebov, Glebov, Sabo, in this 14. Uh, the conjecture is, in some sense, in the spirit of, of uh, this wild. Thing I was mentioning about the triangle removal lemma that maybe Berentine bounds could be possibly true for a triangle removal lemma. Uh, it's a very strong thing to say, but uh, uh, here, in light of this analogy, uh, uh, it seems sensible to expect that this, uh, this uh, combinatorial function, the r type version here, is also upper bound by a linear quantity in T. For every R, at least uh, two, there is some sense of R such that um, have RT is upper bound by CR times T. In other words, perhaps it could be true that uh, uh, linearly many matchings of size T are needed in R in the form to give you a rainbow, just because, in some sense, maybe this. Uh, Erdos Ginsburg Ziv resolved by Alan Lubiner in many dimensions should be true for combinatorial reasons. It should be maybe a statement about, about, uh, about hypergraphs. <clears throat> so what breaks on that proof for hypergraphs? Uh, on that proof? Yes, yes. So I'll say I'll say something in a, in a second. Uh, essentially, some fractional matchings of a certain size, but it's hard to pass to inter integer matchings. <clears throat> Um, even if you know that all the parts of the portrait the hypograph are the same. Uh, yeah, even so, even so. So it's, uh, there are some results though. Uh, um, there's a really nice result that I'll mention in a moment that in fact somehow builds upon this colorful Karate argument and, and shows something positive about this. Before that, let me mention some, uh, some, uh, some known things about it. So, uh, some what, what are some quantitative bounds for this? It has been studied. Um, so some no results. <clears throat> so, Alon provided the first uh, trivial bound. In fact, it's a bound on the, this function. So, in particular, it's an upper bound on the upper type version. Um, so it's a super exponential bound in T. So something like this with the T minus one divide with, with some maybe factor in R here. Okay, I forget. Um, something like this. <clears throat> and uh, Glebov Sudakov and uh, Prove that this is polynomial in T. Maybe right here, space. So we provide two upper bounds, uh, one which is definitely better when uh, T is large. So this is something like T to the um, 2R plus 1 with some constant that depends on R here. And there is also some exponential. Uh, uh, it's better than this one when 
when p is not so large. <clears throat> but some of us know you're bound in p nonetheless. And uh, more recently, uh, Korea, Sudakov, common, well, let's say 19 or 18, 20, <laughs> I don't know. Um, they uh, showed a very nice upward bound. for every r and every t. Uh, so it's tr choose r times t minus one, which uh, as you can see is on the order of uh, t to the r plus one. There's another, the, the, the other result, there's another result that kind of supports this, uh, this conjecture there that uh, Leo alluded to. Uh, and it's really beautiful. So uh, let's call this conjecture information mark. This conjecture is true for a fractional version. And uh, it was a very nice talk given here at the Institute by Ron Hosman, who's in the audience today. So maybe uh, I shouldn't say too much uh, about this, but uh, let me at least state that it's really, really, uh, really nice statement. So it's a, it's a result by uh, Haroni Hosman Jiang. Um, 19 or 18. Yeah, they essentially showed that um, for 3R, um, any uh, family of uh, say, subsets of edges of size. Take r times n, uh, sorry, r times t. Take r times t minus r plus one uh, subsets of edges in the graph, in, in the r uniform hypergraph. So h is r uniform. Take such some uh, this many uh, this many edge sets such that there's a fractional matching. Uh, of size at least t in this sense, in all of them. <clears throat> Notice that this function equals precisely two t two t plus one two t minus one. Sorry, when uh, when r equals two. If you have such uh, such a setup, then there is also a rainbow fractional ma fractional magic of size at least t. <clears throat> there is an edge. One from each. So that uh, find a fractional match of size t that's supported in here. So this this. Uh, this is a result that uses builds builds upon this colorful character of proof. It doesn't really use you cannot really use that uh, the same theorem, but it uses a nice nice theorem of uh, Kalai and Meshulam about real array simplicial complexes that uh, uh, implies not colorful character theory, but colorful Halley's theorem, or rather a topological version. It's a very beautiful story that. Uh, that uh, you can you can use something like that to derive this more general statement. So this gives some life to the conjecture, uh, but uh, perhaps a bit surprisingly, at least uh, to me, uh, it turns out this conjecture is false. So finally, let me state this result and uh, I'll give a, give you a break, chance to leave. 
know that's it's kind of standard. Uh, it's a five minute break. Is that it's up to you? I don't know. Is that common? Uh, a break or not? Oh, it's up to the presenter. Yeah. Okay, I want to take a break. Okay, okay, we'll see. We'll see. Let's, let, let me um, uh, state the result first, and then you decide if you want to be in suspense or not. Uh, so, with, uh, with Lisa and Dimitri, last semester sometime, uh, we, we show that for every R, at least three. So, an R uniformity, as soon as you leave the world of graphs. Uh, Uh, turns out the it's no lot it's not no longer true that linearly many matchings of a certain size imply the existence of a rainbow. So for every R at least three, there are constants such that uh, these functions, both the R partite versions and the more general one, they're between uh, p to the power r and p to the power r. So uh, we uh, determine the order of growth as p is large when r is fixed and it's not linear in here. So uh, I'll tell you hopefully the proof of this. Um, okay. Before that, maybe also I should say some uh, some um, some other results that we have that I think are also somewhat interesting. So. Uh, the problem in the opposite regime. So in the regime when, uh, when P is fixed, and R grows. That's also interesting. has been suggested by uh, several people. Most of them included among the people I mentioned already, just maybe to convince you uh, to take matchings of size two. So these are matching consisting of two edges. Like this, these are sets of size R. So R in the form hypergraph still. Okay. Okay, so if, 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 uh, if I give you a list of matchings, let's say from one up to N and there's no rainbow, Size two. What does this mean? Well, uh, you can associate two, collect two families of uh, sets of size R uh, in a very natural way. So, take the first edges from uh, uh, from the matchings, put them, put them as the first first things here. Take the second uh, edges, putting a, put, put it as the second half of uh, the list of A's here, and do the opposite below. So here T one, put me in. Am I being a matching? Means that these things are disjoint. So in particular. AI never intersects the I. And no rainbow means that AI always intersects BJ. I is different than J. So a question of how many such sets can you have, fixed sizes, these properties there. And in the spirit of what's called this Bolobash to, to set system theorem. So you can prove that n is upper bound by an exponential uh, in R in this case. In fact, I think the answer uh, exactly this. It's an observation of a Haronian burger from the original paper. And it's kind of interesting to study this when t is larger also because of higher uniformity versions of this Bolobosch type extreme one set, set, set uh, system properties are have all sorts of applications. <clears throat> uh, and there's also a funny story that kind of mimics this Erdos Ginsburg Zip story. So, uh, Erdos Ginsburg Zip is also a problem that makes sense when P is fixed. The dimension grows, 
can, you can guess maybe what uh, 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 what what is the relation? What is the relation is the same relation, of course, with this function. But maybe based on that, another question, and maybe uh, I'll stay as a question rather than conjecture. That holds and uh, symbol. So perhaps I guess maybe motivated by what happens here and uh, the uh, um, um is there an absolute constant so independent of t such that this function the r by type one perhaps also the general function this is upper bound by this constant raised to the power r so such such a thing is kind of believed to be true for the Erdogan's Brzee constant unlike the Alon Dubina result it's far from being settled so uh, there's a uh, there's work in this direction that I won't really mention <clears throat> Best known and the results here. Uh, uh, this regime is something like e to the power r, maybe e to the so an exponential. And here, uh, it's really this. Uh, this result of Korea Sudakov and Tomon that I mentioned. <clears throat> which is uh, the order in this regime where, where R grows kind of like this. Exponential R where the base this guy. So this, if you want, is kind of like E times T when it is uh, substantial. So this, this function is upper bound by something like this. <laughs> and now we can settle also this question in the negative. Uh, it's really possible in higher uniformity to construct functions with no rainbow and uh, quite a few of them. <clears throat> So two things. Um, we show that this upper bound of Korea Sudakov and Tomon is essentially sharp of two sub-exponential factors. So um, write it again. Some uh, root of R loss and exponent there. It's possible to construct uh, there's many matchings in an in in uniform hypergraph, matchings of size t with no rainbow. With two, uh, we can uh, also do something like this for the apartheid version where there's also some possibility to improve the upper bound. So uh, um, something like instead of, instead of this binomial coefficient, we can replace it with t to the r over there. And, uh, have a t to the r minus the root r on the left side. <clears throat> so this is, uh, uh, this improve on this lower bound here. It shows that something like this cannot be possible with a constant that's independent of t, just because what well, this is kind of like e times t. <clears throat> um, so yeah, let me. Uh, mention something about proofs. So I think maybe, <clears throat> yeah, but okay, feel free. Let's, let's take maybe take a two, three minute <laughs> break. I don't want to torture you. Uh, um, in the meantime, I'll raise the board. <laughs> um, so
Um, if you assume that the matching to the hypergraph were perfect to start with, then it should work in the integrality, right? No, so I think with. Um, because you could just say, well, you have endpoints on each of the parts. Now you wrote it as a convex combination. Uh, if two of them collide because of the fractional matching, then one of the vertices won't be covered in, one of, in the parts where they collided. But that's assuming that the matchings were perfect. Yeah, no, so. But it, it doesn't it, work if it, it, it. It doesn't work even for perfect. So the examples I'll give you even for, perfect. for perfect. So this integrality is a, is a problem. This, uh, this, this argument does give you fractional, perfect fractional matchings of size t, already even less. Yeah. With a linear number, you start with a linear number of matchings, you get you can get uh, uh, fractional perfect. But then from fractional perfect matching, in our uniform graph, you cannot really find an integral. You can find some matching, integral matching, but not perfect. So some fairly large matching with linear size. So these are these inequalities between okay. mu and mu star and so on. So it's, okay. it's just false. It's plain false that. Uh, okay. It, yeah, I have to look into the proof again. <laughs> Just yeah. see, uh, unless something. No, no. So, uh, here's, so this Karatodori argument works perfectly fine. To just output fractional perfect match. So this, right, this that's one, that's fine. But but I was thinking like if the original matchings were perfect, and while well, you wrote something as a conic combination, or did all ones vector as a conic combination, but you only use n of them, right? No, but you use two n minus one. Oh, you use two n minus. You use it. You use more than that. You know that there's some kind of. Oh, you're yeah, right. That's the thing. No, no. I, I thought you would use that because oh. if you, you yes. use that, it was obvious. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because if two of them collide, then, then one vertex won't be covered. But you're right. You use more. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, that, that's what I was missing. <laughs> yes. It's all right. Misunderstand. Okay. Misunderstood also. <clears throat> And I also lost you here again. Didn't you say that you proved that FRT is at least t to the r? Like yeah, the board. Uh... Yeah. So this, these were these different regimes. So uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the result is the like the yeah, first result that you stated. What did mm -hmm. you say? Yes. Did I erase it already? Oh. No, I think it's behind the the board that you and I are raising. Like it's yeah, it's here. <laughs> yes, it's perfect. Yes. So this is saying that. If I fix the uniformity, let's say it's a three uniform hypergraph, then I can construct T cubed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can construct T cubed matchings of size T. There's no rainbow. It's three uniform. And in here. <laughs> and here it's different. Uh, here now the matchings are, are small, are tiny. So think matchings of size three, three edges, on three digit edges. And now is the uniformity that you should think large. <clears throat> oh, okay. uh, uh, saying that uh, you have this, you can construct this many matchings of size two oh, or rainbow. Okay. So it's just opposite from that. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> I still wait a minute, but I'll write, uh, I guess, the first thing I'll start with, I guess, I'll mention the construction for this. Uh, it's quite uh, short and sweet. So it's a construction of, let's say, in Fixed in regime, one t cubed matching of size t. No rainbow matching of size t. Yeah. 
kind of stupid question if you're about it. Yeah. Uh, um, so is the bad case for this when you're working in a really big hypergraph and T is much smaller, or are these like near perfect matchings? So I, I'll give you an example of perfect matching this. Okay, so I need the book. Yeah. Um, and then, so yeah, I guess I can start maybe. Uh, so I just maybe prove my picture almost. Uh, I'll construct for you in the fixed uniformity regime, so three and four hypergraphs, T cube matching the size T. And three and a form H, no rainbow, as promised. I'll do my, my best to give you perfect matchings. <clears throat> it seems indeed that the case when T is large is kind of kind of the most interesting. So I'll give you a construction in the three paratite case. Uh, the three, three groups of T vertices, and I label them by the elements of the interval from one up to T. And okay, I will single out three special vertices. They don't have to be the last three, but they can be. Distinguished vertices, A1, A2, A3. They're the same labels in each. And then I take a partition of the rest, of the numbers from one up to T into three sets of equal sizes, X1, X2, X3, okay. So x1 equals x2 equals x3 of the t over 3. The plan for every element x1 and x1, x2 and x2, and x3 and x3 will give you a matching. One, x2, x3. Label where x1, x2, and x3 land. I'll label them in, you know, uh, put the label in the corresponding group. But of course, there's a copy of x1 here, copy of x1 here, copy of x2 here, copy of x2 here, copy of x3 here, copy of x3 here. These are the same numbers labeled there. <laughs> So it's kind of hard to draw edges in a three uniform graph without completely destroying the picture. So uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll mark with the specific color to just emphasize. I'm talking about the single matching, it gets its own color red. And I'll mark, so given that I'm doing perfect matchings, I should really match all the vertices in the, in the picture. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, tell you an edge that I'm adding and I'm gonna cross the vertices that get matched. Okay, so the first, first edge in here, is this diagonal, A1, A2, A3. <laughs> okay, now I want to match these two. I cannot match them with this. I can match, could match them with this, but I'll match them. I'll use this X1 for this purpose. So I'll match X1 um, A1 and A1. I need to match these two. I'll use X2 to cover these. Need to match these two, I'll use X3. So these are all nicely matched. Now these are matched, but I still have to deal with the copies of X1, copies of X2, copies of X3 from the different groups. Uh, what I do, I'll include the cyclic shifts of X1, X2, X3. So I'll do X2, X3, and X1. And then X3, X1, X2. <clears throat> it's kind of like creating a non-trivial braid in some sense. Uh, Kind of the, the, the opposite, what would be a completely anti example, an anti construction would be to, of course, take all the diag all, all the horizontal edges. It would be just T cubed matchings, I guess, T cubed copies of the same matching. Of course, it has a ton of rainbow matchings of size T, as many as possible, probably. You can even prove that. Uh, so, this is kind of creating some, some twist among these, these, uh, these six different uh, vertices and different groups. And somehow, the claim is that if you do this, 
for every uh, uh, trace of uh, x1, x2, x3, and the corresponding groups. Somehow, we cannot really untangle these braids at the same time. <clears throat> uh, that's kind of a loose analogy. So let me, let me maybe let me try the matching first. So I probably will. The full matching. It's easy to see. It. Uh, I didn't okay include some. Okay. I, mean, I only match these. Yeah, the other ones are just the horizontal ones. So for every every other i, that's not one of these. I include that edge. So together with uh, some <clears throat> more space. Together with uh, the union. For all eyes that are not these numbers. Okay. Um, Hopefully, you can at least that these are perfect matchings. We briefly check really that they're also uh, don't have any rainbow. It's pretty easy, I think, once uh, the construction is down. You draw a different picture. You see some words. Um, so this collection matchings there's no rainbow Well, uh, try to this again. A one, A two, A three. A one, A two, A three. A one, A two, A three. I have my partition. One, two, three. Now, okay. Let's suppose I have some rainbow matching. Well, these matchings in this list include this diagonal here. A1, A2, A3. No matter how the rainbow looks like, it must include an edge that has that starts like this. Okay. Good. Um, now, uh, what's going on? We need uh, to match, let's say, these two guys. The only way we can get to cover these two guys with edges from here. <clears throat> Would be uh, if you add uh, some some vertex in here. So you need something in here. Plus, and notice that this specifies some element x one in here. So you will use some green matching of x one. I don't know exactly what are the other choices. There will be some green matching that uh, covers these two, and you need some some edge that looks like that. Same for these other ones to cover this and this. You, you will need an edge that looks just like this. We'll specify some vertex x2 in here. Cover uh, this and this. There's no other way. I need a vertex. There's a vertex in here. And the yellow edge that looks like this. <clears throat> so this will be for my matching. This shape. Okay. Okay, but now once I have some elements uh, in are specified, I have to start worrying about what to do with the copies in the other groups. So I have to start worrying what happens with these two. How do they get matched? And notice that there are not many kind of edges that match things like this. 
So for instance, uh, okay, I cannot really match these with the horizontal edge because this would cover the green one <coughs> and uh, the outcome will not be a rainbow perfect matching, so a perfect matching to begin with. Okay, so this cannot, this cannot be covered with the horizontal. Okay, but uh, so that if you, if you look at the list, well, it must, if you want to hope to cover, let's say this guy, well, you want maybe uh, something in here and something in here. So edges that are these cyclic shifts. <clears throat> uh, that's possible. Okay, but then uh, if you include something like this, then you start have to worrying about its copy here. Okay, this must be covered with a different color. But notice that once I specify, I don't know how to add all the colors here. Uh, uh -huh. okay, once I put an, an uh, orange uh, edge that is not really coming from the matching M of M of X one X two X three, so it's a new new color. Okay, so once I put something here that's not really X two, so this this, so let's say I have a picture that looks like this. Cover this one. Now I use this. Once I do something like this, notice that I'm failing to cover its copy of this guy in this list because all the edges that cover numbers in the middle group and group two are just edges that cover uh, these two guys and this. So there's no way to cover this other than with horizontal edges. That's kind of the point. So if I were to add some orange edge that covers this top guy in here, it must really be involving these, uh, these uh, specified vertices from before. It's quite possible indeed that you're using this one between uh, x1, x2, and x3. We didn't really use this orange matching yet. But notice that what I just argued is that to match this, you really need to use an edge in M of X1, X2, X3, there's no, there's no, uh, you cannot, you cannot use uh, something else. And uh, when you have like a side. No, so uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I'm gonna, it's, uh, it's not too difficult to, to, to check that. So the claim is, if you want to just match this guy, uh, uh, the copy of X1 that you just match with green, um, from group two, the claim is that you really must use an edge from the matching x1, x2, x3. It's this analysis that no matter how else you want to try to do it, you're going to have to end up using either a horizontal edge and uh, or, or or cover some some words that you used before. <clears throat> and then the point is that you really need to uh, you also need to cover this guy and then to cover this guy. Uh, you're also going to need to use an orange, an edge from this match. So essentially, you cannot get a rainbow because you're going to have to use different colors from from this. <clears throat> well, yeah, you have a bunch of these like cyclic shifts. X one, X two, X three. Yeah, yeah, X one, X two, X three. Yes. Three. Maybe to use like the, the, the second copy of X one, but something that has nothing to do in, in the third thing. But now that leaves them covered or something on the second, but then you keep doing it and, yeah. and then it closes to a cycle. No, no, so that's not possible. Let me, let me say it backwards. So kind of the observation is that if I pick a vertex in here, that's not X1, okay, and I want to cover it, there are not many kind of edges in here that can cover it. So I cannot really use an edge that covers these guys anymore from a different edge because these vertices are covered, they're fixed, okay. Uh, so all I can do to cover a vertex that's in the first group and not X1 is by using uh, horizontal edges, <clears throat> diagonal ones. There's no cyclic shift that covers something in X1 that's different than X1. <clears throat> okay. Wait, Same here. Why, why are there no cyclic shifts? Why, why can't you so the cyclic shifts cover, you know, it's, uh, they cover things in this group. They cover things in this group. There's no cyclic shift that covers something in X1 for the first, in, in, the, in the first group here that contains X1. There's no cyclic shift that covers this guy, these guys that are not X2. No cyclic shift that covers other guys in here. So any, any vertex that's in here, if you want it to be covered, it must be with the horizontal thing. 
So that's what I'm using here, Dwight. Ah. I'm using the fact that once I add some orange edge, a cyclic shift that's not in here, but some, something that I put before, that involves x1, involves something else, and something else, maybe the same thing here. But as soon as it involves something that's different than x1, x2, x3 in some order, so it involves something else, then you must worry about covering this guy, and this guy you cannot cover with cyclic shifts. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I getting, what I was getting wrong is that you, you really insist that your matchings are x1, x2, x3 with x1 and x1, yeah. x2 and x2 and x3. If yeah, you swap right. the order, there's no matching. Yes, yes, that's very important. So, yes, so, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that means. Yeah, so we were actually debating the other day. I feel like there must be some kind of less ad hoc kind of argument. There's no rainbow. I mean, I don't expect there's some kind of group theoretic argument that you can use in the Bray group, but it feels like, you know, there's should be some kind of nice, you know, uh, nice way to see that there's no rainbow, like some kind of product is, there's no product of size t equal to zero or something, it's some kind of non-abelian group, or I don't know, whatever. But I hope this makes sense for, for arbitrary uniformity is not that much harder. <clears throat> okay, so I have, I think it's only half an hour left to tell you about the rest. So I won't be able to add the space, I think, but I think to maximize a little bit, the amount of information and entertainment. Uh, we'll do the following. <clears throat> so, about the upper bound? Yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about upper bound. Um, maybe some words about this first, like not more than five minutes. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, where, where, where are they coming from in this, this other kind of regime? So the constructions, here the constructions are a bit more complicated. Um, they, roughly speaking, rely on constructions that apply, that, that appeared in the context of recent developments for the capsid problem. So these are these uh, constructions of many triples without uh, ray, rainbow sums equal to zero and F3 to the n that show that the slice rank arguments for the capsid problem are sharp if you apply them to the more general problem of finding uh, uh, multicolor some free sets in F3 to the n, whatever that means. Um, so what, how, how does that, uh, how does this fit? So the, the proof of this uh, Correa Sudakov common upper bound, This thing yeah. uses the rank argument. Not a slice rank argument, but it's linear algebraic in nature. Um, okay. Um, so I don't know to what extent um, I can tell you. Maybe I'll put some thick words on this board. So if I give you. of T matchings in R uniform H. Don't worry about what variable is fixed. This is for every R and T. Um, such that there's no rainbow. I want to show you that N is at most this. <clears throat> and the, the, the point is uh, to consider V could be um, vector space dimension T times R N over F, where F is some uh, infinite field of characteristic two. For every vertex of my hypergraph, um, we associate a vector inside Z in such a way that the set of vectors you write down. 
Uh, let's set that in general position. In other words, any n of them that you write down, they're going to be independent. Um, okay. What next? For every edge in this graph, let's say for every subset of uh, all vertices, you consider the which product of the corresponding vectors in the corresponding exterior algebra? Um, so you look at the corresponding vectors for each each vertex and A, take the on this uh, each wedge product, it's on this hard power. A v, and notice that because we're choosing this field to be of characteristic two, this notation actually makes sense. It does not matter what the, the, the choice and the order of the vectors is, this operation is commutative and so on. <clears throat> okay. So what, what am I getting uh, at if uh, if if the matchings are labeled by you may not use E1 for confusion on the standard basis. So, so let's denote the edges and the i matching by uh, AI1, AI2, AIT. Uh, the idea um, is to consider the following tensor. dimensional box T is the size of each matching uh, x values and f so the the okay the this tensor for every t tuple okay I look at the matching corresponding to i1 I look at the first edge in there I compute this this, uh, this w of that edge I take wedge with uh, the same thing, but now for the second matching in the list, I look at the second edge. The last matching, last edge. So it's easy to see that this tensor, when you take all these indices to be equal to each other, but first of all, notice that it actually takes values in F. So this is an element of uh, the nth power, t time, so there are teeth. T wedges in here, this is an element in here, and this is the same as F. And this is semi-diagonal. If I take all these to be equal with some I, well, the fact that the, this is a, a matching of size T, all these edges are disjoint, I only get distinct vectors in here, N of them, so the whole, this, uh, on the diagonal, this is non-zero. Any any wedge product of n of them is non-zero. So this condition, they're in general position. And of the diagonal, so just to clarify what this means, if I choose uh, a set of indices that are pairwise distinct, so this is not the same as saying that not, not all of them are equal. If they're pairwise distinct, the no rainbow property implies that uh, this tensor the value is to zero. These two properties are enough to hope for a rank argument, like slice rank argument. Slice rank does not work because it's not a really diagonal tensor, it's semi-diagonal. But you can use substitutes. That's what Korea, uh, Surakov, and Tomon do. So, uh, so observation one, observation two, is that another appropriate related notion of rank called the maximum flattening rank. I won't define, but I think you can believe me that well, this being semi-diagonal means that whatever notion of rank you use here has to be kind of large. So you get the lower bound like this. Uh, this is also occupied by the dimension of this r power of the exterior algebra. So this is this uh, n choose r. Where this 
one is coming from, comparing these two sites. So now, in light, in light of a proof like this, it is not too hard to believe that, well, if you believe in uh, constructions for this, this generalization of the capsid problem, so I'll mention here quickly, this is a theorem of uh, Kleinberg, Sawin, yeah, I proved this conditional on the result that was later shown by Norian and everybody. 119 or so. So what did they do? They constructed a collection of triples Elements in F3 to the n, all of them. Uh, and their property is that whenever you have a transversal 3D, where you have a linear combination like this equals to zero from three different uh, uh, coordinates, then it must be because the indices are equal. Hard to see that if you have a 3AP free set, if you just take the diagonal A, A, A where A goes over the 3AP, and this is that's a set of triples with this property. And they constructed a set of triples where they have this property where n is really large, n is at least this uh, 2.756 to the n minus some, some exponent, some root n in the exponents up to some exponential factor. This upper bound, which is the same exponent here. Uh, same exponential function as in the capsid problem. This, uh, this, this, uh, this, that upper bound is achieved for the slightly more general version of this problem. So essentially, what we do here in these constructions is kind of complete the commutative diagram between these results. Essentially, so our, uh, our constructions in the p fixed regime using ideas with like these uh, how these constructions look like. So we show that. There's a collection of uh, matchings. So ones are top tuples, t tuples rather than triples. Um, and n is at least, well, this, uh, this kind of upper bound from the Korea sudakov tomon argument. So this, this thing four. Some error. So there is a collection of matching. It's probably that they don't have satisfying any rainbow. In fact, something stronger is true. Uh, for every pairwise disjoint set of edges, If I give you some indices, I1 up to IT and T edges that are pairwise disjoint in this list, uh, you must have that uh, the indices are actually equal with each other. So not only that there is no rainbow, every time you have a set of T disjoint edges, they must really come from the same matching. Okay, so that's kind of what, what I wanted to say about the fixed T regime story. Somehow this. Even though it's a, it's a different setup, it's kind of somewhat inspirational for, for this upper bound too. So in the last 10 minutes, let me try to sketch what that happens. Essentially, long story short is that, well, uh, this linear algebra proof that I sketch is really sharp. There's no hope to use linear algebra to improve on this bound. So on one hand, you have this kind of construction that matches. On the other hand, well, if you take a natural abstract version of this, of, of this result where uh, you replace this funny tensor by a more general multilinear function. So I give you a vector space. I take the t power of that vector space and I, and I ask for multilinear maps 
uh, that kind of has satisfied the no rainbow property for tuples, for t tuples. So that kind of abstract generalization of the problem is actually sharp. So uh, the, if you take some kind of generalized inner product, uh, that, that's typically a common enemy for rank arguments. If you're familiar with like permanent determinant problem uh, in CS, that kind of appears there too. So uh, proof, all this uh, saying, can I really build linear algebra? So what we do is essentially to use ideas from these recent developments for the sunflower lemma. So it uses ideas of Alwise, Lovett, Wu, and Zhang. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, Okay, so uh, main ideas. For uh, this upper bound. So this is back to our fixed regime. Okay, and uh, the list of uh, imagines no rainbow. And I really want to show um, that uh, n is small, so something like this. More precisely, we show tr plus t to the power r. <clears throat> okay, so what do we do? Uh, speaking, uh, so let F we hold the, the full collection of edges that are involved in these matchings. If I take the union, these matchings, uh, okay, so F is a collection that, uh, so let, let's say, maybe let me not state in the contrapositive. Let me, let me just say that N is large. So it's strictly greater than this bound. And I want the ring. Okay, so I take all the edges involved, put them in a list, and now I consider the following filtration. All right, do the following. So if I reach an index, um, where my set is smaller than the number of matchings in the list, so it's smaller than this threshold, <clears throat> then stop. And this would be my last FL. Otherwise, so this FK did not reach that stage yet. Uh, um, define FK plus one to be FK. Minus, okay, maybe I should define something first. Take uh, a set SK of vertices such that the, the edges in FK that contain this group of vertices is large. <clears throat> of the full FK, a fraction that looks like this. It's kind of a technical definition. I'll try to justify it in a second. So you look at the set like this, maximal with this property. Notice, of course, that the empty set satisfies this. By the way, this is notation, number of edges. K that contain this group of vertices. Um, Okay, and then what's what's the what's fk plus one? Fk plus one. What you obtain by removing from fk all these 
all these subsets that contain SK. You keep doing this <clears throat> until you reach some set uh, collection of edges that uh, has size more and PR plus P. Um, for the R, so kind of the, so some words about why something like this is useful. So the point is that uh, a family like this is what's known as these days sufficiently spread. So it's it's essentially a set of edges that has this feature that for every kind of smallish group of vertices, you don't really have too many edges there that contain them. Vertices. And by, by doing this greedy procedure, you really remove this possibility at each stage. <clears throat> spread families, uh, sets, spread set systems uh, arise quite naturally in the context of the sunflower lemma problem. Right? So uh, they're essentially right if, uh, <clears throat> if you have a group of vertices Z that's common to a bunch of uh, a uh, bunch of edges, let's say edges of size R, right? You can find, you can hope to find T petals, right? With uh, uh, just just from this fact that uh, using this Z as the kernel. And the opposite is that the, the family is spread. And if the family is spread, well, essentially spread families are very generous when it comes to embedding elements from there in a random set. So kind of like for sunflowers, if, if you don't have a picture like this, then well, Kind of partition the universe set into t random color classes, and then with very high probability, if you choose the parameters right, each color class high probability contain one of the elements in there, and you kind of get a trivial sunflower just from having a petal with each different color class, in particular disjoint t petals sunflower. Here, what's kind of the point? <clears throat> it's a bit different. So, uh, uh, for us. We want to pick first matching MJ. Okay. So here's this last family. So it's a bunch of sets. Notice there are some vertices that are only covered. There are some edges from my hypergraph that are not covered. So this is a picture of FL. Some let me make it on the way to FL. Some vertices are there. This is FL. And I have a list of matchings. List of matchings that in size is at least the size of FL. So these are my matchings. I want to pick a special matching in J. And then adapt the edges of this matching to construct a rainbow. This is special. I'll mention in a second what special means. <clears throat> uh, so I want to adapt the edges of to construct rainbow out of them. First, what does special mean? So I want to imagine here that, well, first, if I just restrict to, um, so I don't know, draw it red, this is MJ, okay? It has a bunch of edges that are part of FL. Okay, so in the incidence graph, it's a picture that kind of looks like this. These are all edges that are involved in FJ, J. There will be some edges like this that are part uh, in MJ, and there will be some edges here that uh, that are not. Let's let's call them. Let's give them names. So uh, one star all the way up to E P star. This is the last one, E M star. So M of them, let's say, are uh, are in F L here. <laughs> So the first, what, what does special mean? It doesn't really use the spreadness property. I want to pick an MJ that's really a good candidate for this kind of adaptivity argument. Namely, I would like at least these edges in FL 
that are part of MJ to be also contained in different matchings of different colors. So it would be really nice if I can pick an MJ, first of all, that uh, has these edges on top. Oh, that is a different color. This one. Also contain some other matchings. So I can basically color them with different colors. They're the same. And this will, I'm slowly starting to grow my rainbow like this, just from this part of MJ. To ensure that some in this like this exists is not too difficult. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, an argument uh, we included there. It's like, okay, imagine that all these edges in F, all these edges in FL. So it's kind of important. It only has to do with the fact that FL is chosen um, to be smaller than, than the number of uh, the number of matchings on the right. So the number of vertices are less than here. And then the point is that if each edge, the, I don't know, it has some edge, it's part of different matchings. Let's say each edge has one Bitcoin or something like this. And you divide your Bitcoin among the matchings that, that, uh, that contain you. Okay, pick a map just from the, the sheer comparison of the sizes. It must be that you have some index MJ that gets at most one Bitcoin, right there, at most n Bitcoins to begin with in the game, each edge gets one. Pick one here that has at most one Bitcoin. This is a matching that is a good candidate to have this kind of adaptivity property. And you can make this precise using whole matching principle argument. Of course, other ways to maybe do it, but uh, that's one idea. And now, okay, nothing is friendness. We use friendness to uh, grow this rainbow matching beyond the felt. So here, it would be really nice if, for instance, you can continue the same game and maybe prove that there's always going to be some new edge of different color, let's say yellow. Uh, well, sorry, some, some, some new matching, yellow, yellow match that contains this edge EM plus one here. And it's just disjoint from all these, uh, disjoint from these. That's really not possible. Uh, takes a moment to move very fine. But uh, using spreadness, it's possible to prove that you can find maybe a different matching. It might have uh, some stuff in common with the matching EM plus one, with, with the edge EM plus one. You're going to find some edge in there. Uh, that will have this desired property. You don't really need to keep this edge like you kept these before. It's enough to find a new edge that's in the yellow matching that's disjoint from these and disjoint from the next. You can do that using spreadness. It's a, it's a nice double counting uh, kind of argument, kind of taking advantage of uh, this choice of this K. I won't spell it out. And kind of you add this yellow edge. And you kind of repeat. Yeah, it's an iterative procedure. You just keep growing this all the way up to here. So I, I, I would. I was hoping to maybe give it and give much more details for this, but you know, I, I ran out of time. So I'll, I'll end here. If you're curious, I'm happy to to say more. Are there any questions? Maybe what are the open problems at the moment? Uh, yeah, so it's the question about general graphs, I guess, in uniformity too. So where it's unclear if to end uh, perfect matchings are enough to give you a rainbow perfect matching. Another open problem of speculation I wanted to put there, I think <laughs> starting with last night. Uh, so. I mentioned this connection with Neurot and induced matching lemma. It's kind of the induced matching lemma has a similar encoding to how uh, Driscoll's theorem encodes Erdos Ginsburg's <clears throat> Um so Here's another question: Dream slash nightmare to channel to, to channel Karim Adipasito's lingo. Uh, So is there uh, and a story like this for the high uniformity version of this matching level? So uh, here's a question. Fix R and these two. Now let H be a uh, uniform 
linear hypergraph. Which is a union of the most and matching. So this is the vertex set is n. Union of uh, at most n induced matchings. What does this mean in the linear hypergraph setting? Uh, let's say in uniformity three, there's no way I can find three edges of a matching. <clears throat> Where there's a transversal edge like this coming from a different match. There's no picture like this. <clears throat> then, uh, so it's the question of, uh, Question. Franklin and Rodo. Well, should it be true? And it's a conjecture that maybe uh, the positive should be true. The positive statement is correct. Should it be true that uh, this, uh, this linear hypergraph is also sparse? And uh, Perhaps it's not too surprising that this implies same Eredi's theorem, like the same way this thing is matching lemma. Same Eredi's theorem for R plus three progressions uses uniformity two for R plus one progressions. It's not a surprise because we know maybe that same Eredi's theorem is proved using hypergraph regularity. Usually, R plus one progressions come from our uniformity, but uh, unlike the hypergraph removal lemma in the dense setting, this turns out to be still quite open question. It implies other things in discrete geometry too. Uh, uh, so I put dream slash nightmare in the sense of there's a question. Is there any chance this could be could be false for, for, for reasons that are maybe related with some of the things I touched on? I have no idea. It's kind of a speculation. Uh, most likely it's correct, maybe. Uh, it would be definitely very interesting to see a proof. <clears throat> More questions? Let's thanks, Cosmic again.